Hello everyone, I am Christian Espana Schmid and I have a beautiful case presentation and I'm telling you there are still very interesting things to learn in medicine and I have a very interesting case for you guys. Um, this is a case presentation, basically a 74 year old female who presented to the hospital because of fever and chills. Um, the patient was in her usual state of health until one week before coming to the hospital Presenting some malaise and fever, she had no prodrome. She denied any shortness of breath, denied any sick contacts, she denied any cough at that moment. Um, her past medical history was significant for diabetes mellitus, hypertension. Uh, she basically denied smoking, drinking alcohol, or using illicit drugs. And she's independent, lives with her husband, having, having a normal life. Uh, when, when she was seen in the ED, the patient had a blood pressure 187 over 97, a little bit hypertensive. The heart rate was 98, the respiratory rate was increased, uh, temperature was essentially normal, the SAO2 was 94 on 2 liters of O2. Um, she was alert at the end of times 3, cooperative, not in acute distress. Um, HENT was normal. The heart was normal, and I uh, hear the heart of this patient never found a murmur or a gallop. Uh, chest was normal, essentially normal. Uh, abdomen, there was a little bit of ab abdominal pain over the right upper quadrant of the device. I, I couldn't find any mass or any organomegaly. Having said that, the patient was slightly uh, obese. Um, neuro examination was unremarkable. These are the last one admission, so you can see that there was leukocytosis. 75% um, of that were neutrophils. The CAN7 was essentially insignificant except for um, 226 of uh, glucose, and a lactic acid was increased. The AST was 54, uh, slightly increased from the 44 uh, units per liter. Uh, ALT was normal. The total bilirubin was 1.9 milligrams per deciliter with the predominance of direct and GGT was increased 417 uh, units per uh, liter and um, the ALKFOS was uh, increased and 440 units per liter. Uh, the patient was admitted under the diagnosis of severe sepsis and this is based mainly uh, the presence of lactic acid, the history of fever, uh, leukocytosis, uh, tachypnea, maybe, uh, uh, and, and of course she, she had severe sepsis at that moment. She had abnormal liver enzymes, so we were thinking there was something going on uh, in the liver. Hypertension, uh, diabetes mellitus type 2, and possible coronavirus infection. Of course, this is the time of the novel uh, coronavirus uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 and she was uh, admitted to one of the floors for that. She had blood, uh, blood cultures and a CT of chest and abdomen. Uh, the CT of the chest was essentially normal as well as the uh, chest x-ray. This chest x-ray uh, is essentially normal as you can see it's an AP x-ray from the patient. Um, and the CT of the abdomen demonstrated this an increase of the size of the uh, intrahepatic biliary ducts, which is dramatic. We were not able to see any masses or any megaly. You can see uh, the kidneys were essentially normal and everything else was normal. Um, the initial treatment was based on IV fluids. Patient was hypertensive, but she um, was with a lactic acid of 4.9, um, and uh, she was starting IV fluids, ceftriaxone, and metronidazole, thinking of uh, that moment possible ascending cholangitis. And because of that, an MRCP was also done, and you can see the MRCP is significant for a, for a lot of um, intrahepatic biliary dilatation. And uh, we couldn't see a mass or anything, but there is definitely a structure uh, uh, on the uh, uh, sphincter of Odi. And um, then the patient continued to get better, but uh, there was a significant improvement. The lactic acid went to normal. However, now her uh, bilirubin was increased to 3.4 and an ERCP was programmed. The patient was doing well. Um, however, she now looked icteric, very, very icteric. 
and a positive blood culture came from Streptococcus pneumonia. Because of that, I review again the CT of the chest, and I could not find any infiltrate or any uh, consolidation that uh, explained that. And uh, the PCR for the COVID-19 was negative already twice. So um, this patient had streptococcus pneumonia and a possible uh, ascending cholangitis. So she was continuing metronidazole and ceftriaxone at this moment. And um, but it's interesting that when when you when when you see the literature, um, there is very few cases of ascending cholangitis secondary to the streptococcus pneumonia. So we were thinking, what uh, it could happen, what it could do, what why this patient was having uh, streptococcus in the blood without any other places. So. Um, so shall, shall we just treat the cholangitis and stop there or look for another expl explanation? So this is what happened in the ERCP. The ERCP demonstrated a high-grade mass-like structure that dilated, uh, that, uh, that was dilated and biopsied. No pus was recovered. So now we have this patient with positive blood cultures in um, without an explanation because we have a bas uh, basically a, a, a CT of all the, the whole body uh, showing us that she does not have any um, any uh, um, uh, abscess or any any focus where the streptococcus is coming. So we believe that um, needed to an echocardiogram needed to be done. An echocardiogram, a trans uh, thoracic, did not demonstrate much, but a trans esophagic esophagic echocardiogram that we can see here demonstrates in the uh, posterior leaflet of the uh, mitral valve uh, that a mass-like structure that is about 1 centimeter times 0.8 centimeter, so about 1 centimeter square centimeter, that um, goes beyond the midline in, in that valve. Um, and um, we believe this patient was having at that moment endocarditis. So very rare case. and. Um, after that, the liver enzymes went to normal. A diagnosis of high structure of the biliary tree was made and biopsies were pending. Because of the absence of pneumonia and the presence of many positive cultures, the transesophageal echo was performed demonstrating a vegetation of the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. The patient treatment at that moment was changed to subtraction 2 grams IV every 24 hours. So it's interesting that now we have a patient with two things. The first one, uh, a high-grade stenosis of the um, of the splinter of Ori that needed to be stented and biopsied, and then we have also uh, a patient with endocarditis. What came first, we don't know, and what were the um, the specific specific uh, risk factors for this patient, we don't know. But a high index of suspicion was needed. Uh, the next day, uh, while the patient was in the service, she the, uh, presented with altered mental status with bilateral Babinski. There were no other focal signs, but she looked encephalopathic at the moment, and because of that, a CT was performed, and of course, it was negative. However, an MRI demonstrated in the perfusion scan this. You can see multiple uh, white or hyper-intense uh, points that are widespread in the white and uh, gray matter of of her brain. It's innumerable. You can see one in each uh, slice of the MRI. And this is an embolic phenomena, uh, mycotic uh, thrombus from that mitral valve. So this patient, of course, was not anticoagulated. This, uh, this um, uh, strokes that are um, emboli that are coming from vegetations are highly, highly prone to hemorrhage. And also, specifically in pneumococcus, this can lead to uh, meningitis, which is of um, very bad prognosis. So, here we have endocarditis secondary to streptococcus pneumonia. Um, regarding the stricture, we wait for the biopsies, and 
she uh, had a invasive adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. So we, we needed to think about that when we were taking account uh, our next decision. So it's interesting that only 3% of all endocarditis are currently secondary to streptococcus pneumoniae. And usually there is a, there, there is a, a place from these endocarditis are coming. It's just 0.1 of all endocarditis of nature valves. And usually we see that in valves that are um, or in prosthetic devices. Um, high suspicious is needed. So uh, we, we didn't find any pneumonia, we didn't find anything. So high, the high suspicious let us uh, make us thought that she was having uh, endocarditis and needed the uh, echocardiogram, the transthoracic and transesophageal. Um, so it's of course more common in prosthetic material and treatment for native heart uh, valve is usually with high dose antibiotics. However, 30% of more will need surgery. And it's very interesting when I was checking uh, about pneumococcal endocarditis, as I said, usually it's in prosthetic valves and it carries a mortality at the end of almost 40%. So uh, usually early intervention is one of the, of the things that are debated here despite the size of the valve. It seems uh, pneumococcus seems to be a very, very um, difficult uh, uh, bacteria to treat in endocarditis. Um, however, uh, we of course call uh, uh, cardiothoracic and cardiothoracic uh, at the end said uh, this patient had um, cancer of the... Of the uh, pancreas and now we are talking about uh, opening her heart. She's satisposed all these strokes and very encephalopathic and really not much um, focal uh, nerve uh, dysfunction. She was um, then transferred to our um, stroke unit just for monitoring but we will not go and perform anything and usually it's very important to remember that you have endocarditis and uh, the highest time to have uh, emboli is within the first week when you start antibiotics and after that first week you should not have more emboli. So how you diagnose endocarditis in the real world? This is a very very difficult uh, patient and had two things. So endocarditis you need to remember the criteria and um, there's major and minor criteria. The major criteria is having a bacteria in the blood culture that is that usually uh, produce endocarditis. Uh, typical microorganisms uh, such as strep viridans, um, HASEC, streptococcus, bovis, or um, strepto staph aureus. Those are very important uh, organisms, especially if you find a strep aureus. Uh, uh, sorry, staff hours that um, it's uh, that you don't have an abscess or something, and you don't have a, a reason why the patient has a staff hours in in, in, the, in the blood. You should suspect endocarditis. So of course, patients who have um, some sort of uh, risk. Then uh, we have. Of course, uh, the evidence of endocardial uh, involvement, which can be with TEE, uh, transthoracic e e echocardiogram, can be with other types of imaging, or you at the end slice the heart and open the heart and you have the uh, valve with endocarditis and you can see the microbe inside the valve. So this is the major criteria. So it's very straightforward. You have, um, you have first... Uh, bacteria that goes with endocarditis and second you have uh, involve, involvement that uh, um, uh, that is demonstrated um, anatomically of, of the um, heart. Then you have uh, new in the mi minor criteria which um, it's like predisposition factors like IV drug use or something like, like having uh, any, any type of uh, prosthetic valves um, temperature, of course, uh, vascular phenomena, 
uh, microbiology evidence, uh, positive blood cultures that do not meet really the criteria, but they are not going away. Uh, in this case, we had positive blood cultures of the streptococcus pneumonia, which was a minor criteria. We had fever, which was a minor criteria, although we did not uh, have fever in, in the hospital. And um, we had, um, at, at the end, we have a high suspicion. So that's how the end, she ended up in the TEE. Then the diagnosis of endocarditis uh, is definitive, possible, and rejected. So in, to, to talk about the boards, probably in the boards, uh, in, li in real life, but especially in the boards, uh, th the idea of the boards is that they are not going to give you things that are half and half. They are going to give you things that are more, uh, more straightforward for that. So they are going to give you probably a patient with a new murmur, a patient with um, with a fever, a patient who has a significant risk factor and has possible positive uh, cultures for a, a, um, a specific organism that makes uh, the, that is from that 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 cause endocarditis, and then they are going to ask you what is going to be your next step, and your next step is to diagnose. So they are going to ask you probably between transthoracic so, uh, transthoracic echocardiogram and um, the, the use of transesophageal echocardiogram. And of course, transesophageal, as we are going to see, is better. Um, other types of imaging, although very uh, useful, they don't have a lot of... Um, um, still, they are, not, they, they are not completely studied. And they are not complete. There is not a lot of uh, agreement in the use of other type of, of of imaging. So probably those imagings are not going to be in the test. But it's important that you know that. Um, so definitive uh, endo infective endocarditis. Of course, you have a patho the pathology. Um, the other one is that you have a, a microorganism that is. That the, that by culture or histology, and of course you have a TEE or a TTE that demonstrates the presence of uh, vegetation or an abscess. Um, then um, how you see two major criteria. Of course you have endocarditis, one major criteria and three minor criteria. Just remember the minor criteria: predisposition. Right, the fever, vascular phenomena, microbiologic uh, evidence, and echocardiography can, that cannot eliminate the the the, uh, the diagnosis, and then rejected when you have a different diagnosis. Of course, resolution of the of the endocarditis within four days is most likely was an artifact or something else. No pathologic evidence after you slice the heart and does not meet any criteria. So it's very important to remember the criteria, just definitive, possible, rejected. And remember, the major criteria is basically you have a, a very uh, obvious microorganism that will cause endocarditis. Um, you will have an evidence of, uh, of a intracardiac lesion that is from endocarditis or you slice the heart and then the minor criteria which is all all the others so um, the signs of endocarditis um, fever usually is, is the most more universal um, uh, sign new murmur worsening of old murmur hematuria vascular emboli 17 percent it's not that much this patient had vascular emboli, splenomegaly, which this patient did not, did not have, splinter hemorrhages, osler nodes, uh, genuine lesions, and rod spots. So rod spots probably are not going to come in your, in, in your board because they, they are very, very, very um, uh, rare. However, um, they, they may tell you that the, the, there are uh, red spots in the in the, in the retina, in that you should think it's a rod spot. Um, uh, it's very important um, 
to see that new murmur is 48% and that used to be more, much more, I mean, that might be secondary of the lag or uh, we are losing our, uh, our, our time with the patients and our uh, critical uh, auscultation um, uh, critical auscultation uh, um, abilities so it's it, it is interesting that it's not anymore one of the most important things uh, once I have a, a worsening murmur this patient ended up in the OR um, and I have I have had I have seen most of these uh, signs during my career um, so it's interesting that uh, of course, autopsy, but we don't want that, the diagnosis. The transthoracic uh, echocardiogram uh, sensitivity goes from 40 to 65. Specificity is 94, as long as you have your positive blood cultures. Transesophageal is very important, 90 to 100%. And specificity is 90 to 100%. And it's excellent to check the wires of a pacemaker or an intracardiac device as well as other, um, other uh, structures. Um, the nuclear cardiac imaging uh, radio level uh, leukocyte scintigraphy has a sensitivity from 40 to 100% and a specificity to 71 to 100%. So what happened here is that they radio level uh, leukocytes and those leukocytes will migrate to the uh, valve or the uh, prosthetic uh, material that you have in the heart and they will light up in the in the, in the in the cat scan pet scan and that can give you the uh, um uh the uh, the the uh, answer that whatever you are seeing in that material is is infective so here the problem is that sometimes you see in the echocardiogram or uh trans thoracic or transesophageal you see the wires and then the wires have free of fibrin and then you have a positive blood cultures for whatever reason and you don't know if this is endocarditis or not endocarditis and one, one way to figure out is the nuclear scan imaging. Although most likely you, we will end up uh, treating this patient as endocarditis at the end. Um, and of course, cardiac computed uh, tomographic and geography sensitivity 93. The specificity 88, um, this is great for, again, for uh, implantable devices and, um, and usually the TEE is the, is the best way to go as long as you have a, a uh, culture. So here we have uh, some, uh, a series that I found and usually it's the staph oros, the most important, streptococci the, uh, after enterococci and other staphylococci. And then all the other ones, very, very few. One Escherichia coli, one Salmonella, one Klebsiella. So it's, it's very difficult to find um, gram-negative uh, endocarditis, although I have seen one. So now we have the Hasset group. So um, Haemophilus non-influenza, Actinobacillus, Cardiobacterium, Echinella, and Kingella, uh, those are uh, fastidious organisms that are difficult to grow, and um, but they come in the board all the time. So I, it's very important to remember. I, I would say that the uh, Echinella is the most the most common secondary to the uh, Haemophilus non-influenza in the boards, or at least in in the training uh, questions. So indications for surgery. Indicated valve surgery or early valve surgery is valve dysfunction with heart failure. So if your patient is dying from heart failure because of the valve dysfunction, probably that valve needs to be changed. Heart failure resulting from valve dehiscence, intracardiac fistula, or severe prosthetic, prosthetic valve dysfunction. Also, this valve needs to be changed. Heart lock annular or aortic abscess or destructive penetration, le penetration lesions. This needs to be also uh, open and treated. And bacteremia more than five and seven days seems to be an indication for that. Uh, so the most important part here is valve dysfunction with heart failure or the hissons 
um, in severe uh, prosthetic valve dysfunction probably are the most important here. In heart block with a aortic abscess, that's a, that's a very, very important to remember. So it is reasonable to uh, think for surgery when you have fungi or resistant organisms. In this case, uh, we know that cervicococcus pneumonia up to 30% will uh, fail antibiotic therapy regardless and uh, has a mortality of 42%. However, in this case, uh, this patient also had cancer. So um, the, that, that's, that's a very, very big complication. So uh, this patient was, at, at the end, the consensus was to treat her with antibiotics. Of course, severe valvular regurgitation and vegetation that are mobile and more than 10 millimeters. So 10 millimeters is the, the, the number that you need to remember in vegetations of more than 10 millimeters of the anterior mitral valve. So 10 millimeters, again, is the, the, um, the number to remember. And relapse of prosthetic valve endocarditis. So you decided not to change the prosthetic valve, and now it has a relapse. So um, this is very... Uh... So for prophylaxis, all procedures that will uh, touched gingival tissue, periodontal region of the teeth, or perforation of the oral mucosa in patients that were high risk. So all these patients need to be um, to have uh, some sort of prophylaxis. And uh, who are the patients at high risk? Very important: prosthetic heart valves, uh, prosthetic repairs like annulus, um, prosthetic previous endocarditis. Sorry unrepaired cyanotic heart disease, cyanotic uh, congenital heart disease that still have some sort of valve dysfunction or prosthetic device, and a cardiac transplant was with a structural abnormal valve. And before, of course, we used to say uh, anyone who has, uh, although it's very rare now, um, rheumatic uh, mitral disease or, or um, bicuspid valves, a, uh, aortic valves. So this, uh, this is a picture of Jane Wynn lesions. Uh, I uh, published this one uh, years ago and I, I love it because I actually came to this patient who was being admitted for severe sepsis. I saw the, the feet of the patient and then uh, um, in further questioning the patient had was using drugs, she had a very bad aortic murmur, um, and that night she ended up with uh, heart failure and with an urgent aortic repair, uh, repair uh, replacement, and um, she did well at the end, she was a very young uh, female, so she did very well at the end um, with her new heart valve, I hope she stopped using drugs, and uh, Clinical perils, patient had pneumococcemia without pneumonia, so that helped us to think that she may have something else uh, explaining the uh, uh, pneumococcemia. And in this case, since the presence of uh, ascending cholangitis is very low secondary to pneumococcus, it's just case reported, we look for the heart and we found the endocarditis. Um, Patients may have more than one diagnosis at the time. So remember, we are treating more and more complex patients. Not all the time everything is uh, answered by just one question. And it used to be like that in, in the past, not anymore. Not everything is COVID-19. And then there are some sincere endocarditis out there. So this was not that sincere, but it was sincere enough. Acute endocarditis emboli is not treated with anticoagulation. Remember that um, they uh, they treated with antibiotics, and if the the uh, the patient persists with embolic phenomena after seven days of treatment with effective anti antibiotics, um, surgery should be considered and consult cardiothoracic from the very beginning, uh, especially in this type of patients who have. A very difficult organism to treat and the lesion in this case was one centimeter times 0.8 centimeters so 
Um, this is a good case to consult cardiothoracic. However, because of the cancer and all, all the problems uh, in it, then that problem that uh, she had in the stroke, she was deemed to be a um, poor candidate surge for surgery. Um, these are some articles that you can read, uh, very, very well written. Uh, these two articles of review and uh, management from JAMA. They, they are available through our internet. And at the end, I have love, not darkness, darkness, sophisticated, not truth, nurse, no delusion, and allow no fear. In these times of COVID-19, allow no fear. So William Osler, um, and he's the one who described the Osler notes. And uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I hope this was of uh, it, this was helpful.